Love's innovative energy. Many of love's most common problems arise from the difficulty of balancing its banal and sublime aspects. On the one hand, when we lose sight of the banal, we tend to become unforgiving of human imperfection, imposing on the person we love the sorts of unrealistic expectations that he or she cannot possibly live up to. We risk turning the radiance we bestow upon the beloved into something he feels compelled to emulate, with the result that our idealizing gesture becomes suffocating rather than augmenting. In such cases, we slide from love to a narcissistic worship of the sublime object so that little of the beloved's independent reality remains visible to us. On the other hand, when we lose sight of the sublime, we strip our beloved of what makes him different from our friends, colleagues, and neighbors. We turn our relationship yet another ingredient of our everyday routine. Hi, and welcome to The Existential Coach. I opened with a quote from Mario Rucci's book, The Singularity of Being Lacan and the Immortal Within. And I do that because this past week, Mari Ruti passed away after her battle with cancer. I'd known that she was sick, um, but I didn't know the extent to which her recovery was... Well, I'd heard that things had been going well through what I'd read, but the cancer ultimately took over and she passed away. I've only come to know her work in about the past year or so. And I came about it kind of by accident through this book, The Singularity of Being. And I forget exactly what it was that jumped out at me, other than I remember the title, The Singularity of Being. And I think with a book, at least for me, and this follows with other things too, works of art and so on there can be something that grabs me about it this intangible quality this thing that grabs me and it's not really clear to me what it is but it feels in this way that we might experience in a desire that I need to gravitate or have or in some way connect with that object of desire and in reading this book, and there's also an audio book of this, um, this as well, I was introduced to Lacan in a way that I hadn't been, and it also introduced me to Mari Ruti in a way that I had not been introduced to her works. And I would subsequently pick up several, several of her books and be dumbfounded and struck by the way in which she could speak so elegantly, so succinctly, and so meaningfully in terms of her personal connection to the material, and do it without losing the reader. It's, in a sense, like she was able to take these critical, theoretical, philosophical psychological ideas and tell them like she was telling a story of existence and from that story unfolded her own weaving of these ideas as signifiers in a way or stories of her experience of our experience of a possible experience and in that sense a kind of miraculous love story where one is speaking about this sublime one is stepping beyond the container of one's existence as a writer as a professor as an artist as a whatever it is and transcending that by aspiring towards an ideal something that was beyond the conventions of being an academic or uh, being you know writing on certain critical theory, philosophy, uh, critical, you know, all of these different kinds of things. And instead, just speaking from a kind of 
authentic voice that reflected the unique experience um, that she had. And I must say, I was really shocked by her death. And I found myself that those couple of days just walking and journaling and thinking. And some of the things that came to mind, some of the things that I began to realize was there was a kind of fantasy I had about Mari Ruti. And that's in part because she taught at the University of Toronto and I'm located in Toronto. And so it wasn't the case that I ever thought I would actually see her. I mean, I, I don't have any real affiliation with the University of Toronto. I did go there when I was younger, but I have no connections to uh, U of T as such. So it wasn't like I thought I would bump into her in the halls or that I, I am in the same circles as her because I'm not. Even so, and I, and I think all the more poignantly, it was because she was at once within reach and out of reach that I was allowed to suspend this kind of fascination with this person. And in that suspended experience, I could keep this thing afloat, even though quite consciously I knew that I would never meet this person. And then she died. And that's when I realized that my fantasy or my imaginings, my dream, whatever you want to call it, was perhaps more real than I had at first been able to acknowledge. That perhaps there was more to this sublimity of experience and expression that had more meaning to me than I was capable of acknowledging. And so I find myself thinking about this person as if I knew them, as if I lost them, yet I didn't know them and I didn't lose them. For all intents and purposes, my life with Mari Ruti has stayed the same, yet somehow it is profoundly shifted. And so this is some of the things I wrote. I just read that a favorite author whose work I have only just begun to know over the past year or so has died. Mariruti died on June 6th, or another source said June 8th. I don't know how long ago this photo was taken, see below, and I put a photo in my journal. I understand she had been sick for some time, yet, as I understand it, she remained very active in her work and her fight to live. I saw a YouTube interview done not too long ago. I knew she was sick, and I'd come across this GoFundMe campaign during a Google search. From what I'd read, Mari had been through hell in her fight to get the medical treatment she needed. And in this GoFundMe campaign, and that's where Heather Jessup, who had set up a GoFundMe campaign, um, was giving updates, including that she that Mari, Mari had passed, um, uh, Jessup writes, Dear friends and colleagues of Mari, I am so sorry to share the news with you, but Mari has died this morning. As you know, Mari underwent every conceivable treatment possible to prolong her joyful, inquiring, generous, and singular life for as long as she could. However, as I recently wrote here, Mari's lungs were severely damaged from living with cancer and from long-term treatments for so long. The writing goes on to talk about how Mari was diagnosed with cancer and she had requested a mastectomy and that was denied her by the surgeon. And the surgeon seemed to take this position from what it was written about that Mari's breasts were more important than Mari. And no matter what she did, no matter what she said, her request was denied. And she sought other forms of treatment, which involved leaving the country, which involved time. And of course, anybody who's familiar with cancer knows that cancer uses time to destroy. 
And so to ignore cancer, to ignore the way in which time itself can become a killer, to close one's eyes, to turn away, does not mean the problem goes away. Quite to the contrary, it means that the problem grows. And this is what happened. Even though she did ultimately go to, as I understand, in England, and she did undergo treatment, so much had happened at that time that it had moved through the various stages and getting to a point where there was no longer enough that could be done with medical treatment to actually save her life. And yet the decision that had been made about Mari's life is painfully ironic. We're talking about a woman who wrote widely and profoundly about gender and the way in which society structures roles and relationships through modalities of gender that place models of power into a position that are not that those models are not questioned they're taken as givens and the given assumption that the doctor or the surgeon was right was just precisely one of those such models now this kind of model operates in a very sinister way or I should say a very duplicitous way in that it is cloaked, if you will, within the kind of pedigree of the person's status and ability as, in this case, a surgeon. And what happens is the lines get blurred between what it means to make a medical decision and what it means to make a decision based upon your implicit structuring or ordering of status. So, for example, if a doctor says, I'm right because I'm a doctor, that's not a medical decision. That's a status decision. If a doctor says I'm right because here's the evidence, then that's moving at least towards an actual informed medical decision. This is an important distinction to make. And I want to introduce the way in which, as a hypothetical at least, Countertransference and transference can operate within such a medical paradigm where the client comes in and wants to, in this case, have her breast removed as a preemptive measure against the cancer that was present. Now, what Mari, in a sense, was saying is, I want to deconstruct what being a woman is, what being a man is, what gender is. Um, the symbolic attributes that we have for genitalia and the way in which they operate um, in our objects of desire can cloud our judgment. And so, and this is again just my take on it, Murray was in a sense saying, I want to deconstruct the structure of gender and save my life in so doing. The act of removing herself from this structure what it is to be a woman as a woman with breasts was not for her the priority. That, looking at it from a transference and countertransference model, created a rupture for the doctor, for the surgeon. He felt that the ordering, the structure of the relationship could be sustained without doing the surgery. The question here is, who chooses? Is it the surgeon's place or the doctor's place to make this kind of decision? If we answer yes, we are saying that there is a structure in place that endows certain people to have rights over other people. If we say no, then we are saying the individual has the right to determine how and what happens to their body. Of course, it's not that simple. If you think about a person who says, I'm coming to the end of my life, I'm very sick, and I want assisted suicide, or I want to kill myself, and we can call it assisted suicide. The question here starts to 
get gray when we say, well, what if the person isn't at what others might consider or what some might consider a sufficiently sick enough position to then, quote unquote, justify assisted suicide? The line, where is that line? Now, I think an argument can be made that in terminal cases, that line, even if it's a little bit this way or that way, a couple of days or whatever it is, might be a little bit more palatable for people. However, when a woman comes in in her 50s, she's got cancer and she says, I want you to remove my breasts. And the surgeon says no. Then some structure has been enacted. Of that, there is no doubt. Now, it's tragically ironic that the person to whom this occurred is a person who has written about precisely these structures and the way in which they operate implicitly within our thinking and therefore are not rational. And so here this person is, and this is what struck me. I I had this image of Mari trying to be heard, a person who has studied and written written and, and thought deeply about these things, about the way in which these structures operate. And here she is with this surgeon who can't hear her, who will not hear her. And the image I had was of Mari lying in a grave. And she was frozen, couldn't move, paralyzed. And each single shovel of dirt was being thrown onto her. And she couldn't move, but she knew exactly what was happening to her. She knew that she was being trapped in a social structure that was being upheld through ignorance under the umbrella of knowledge. And the paradox being, she was the person who could understand the hypocrisy of this way of operating in terms of the assumptions that are embedded into each one of our behaviors. So by shifting and challenging the way the social order works, the role of patient, the role of doctor, the role of man, the role of woman, by her, in a sense, jumping the line, saying, no, I want this to be done. I want this nasectomy to be done. She had, I'm hypothesizing, she had triggered within this surgeon a sense of chaos, uncertainty, that they then responded by negating her rights. And this is where the projection piece, the counter-transference, transference piece, all comes together as him, quote-unquote, saving her breasts was so he could save his ideology the cost of which was her life. Now, some listeners might find this extreme. And again, this is just my hypothesis operating from very little information. I didn't know Amari. I only know some of the things that I read uh, that had been posted on her GoFundMe page. So it's not like I have all of the details. Yet, What seems to line up for me in terms of how this was operating is if we think about Mari's work, and again, I've only been introduced to it within the last, not even 12 months at this point. And what I found so incredibly obvious was the way in which she could unpack these kinds of experiences and point to not the right or wrong path so much as a different path. She could challenge, she could critique, and she could push forward. In a sense, she has, she had this incredible gift to keep the ideas in the air. And that's a really, really special gift. And through the things that I've been inspired by in reading her, if I was to have to narrow it down to a thing... I might have to pick that she had a way in her writing to face extraordinarily 
complex and in some instances conflicting points of view and keep the the ideas in the air keep the balls in the air and so as i think about her and as i think about this experience and what happened to her and as i reflect upon you know her book including the singularity of being i can't help but but notice that and this is something i'd written was he the doctor projected these implicit ideas of woman as nurturer and object of desire could he justify this because he quote unquote operated within a paradigm of condescension a paradigm that Murray has written about with clarity insight and force this doctor's projections his delusions escaped the physical reality of cancer in an almost Lacanian cliche the doctor revealed his jouissance with patriarchy this doctor's joy his pleasure his jouissance exceeded the reality of what cancer cells do and then i go on to try and imagine a little bit of what this doctor might be thinking i, I write in my mind's eye i can imagine the fantasy this doctor projects onto mari as i imagine this she is seen bound within the gaze of his movie of my movie his projections my projections are givens within a system our system my system status a rendering of authority in the midst of uncertainty control and the dynamics of control are based and beset within a segregated self from which these contingent and constructed positions of i other form the very models of our interpersonal relationships what we know or come to know is the force emergent emerging as Schopenhauer's will, Gadamer's prejudice, Nietzsche's Dionysius, Freud's libido, Lacan's lack, Kierkegaard's dread, Sartre's nothingness, the terror of death is denied by saving her breasts. Yet, it is she who is being emotional, she who is being extreme, she who is being irrational. After all, doesn't she know that her breasts are the master signifier of who she is? this idea of making a decision for somebody about their body in particular this idea of making a decision for a woman about her breasts i find shocking and i mean that in a literal way which is to say i mean that it is shocking because that someone would would someone would think and act in a way upon somebody's body without any grounds to do so i.e. they were incapacitated they're not of whatever the legal age is considered to act upon a woman and decide what the woman should do as regards breast cancer i find that to be shocking because in my mind's eye not the doctor's mind's eye in my mind's eye she had and has if that's even possible the right to choose what is going on in her body in terms of her response right she she decides what am i going to do how am i going to treat this am i going to uh, well let's put it this way if a person is allowed to deny medication allowed to say well i don't want to do that because of my whatever beliefs why are they not allowed to say i do and here there might be another part of what's going on behind the doctor and i really have no idea and this speaks to a larger issue that i only touch upon here because i want to stay focused on miss rudy there is within the healthcare system in canada a general sense that it is universal healthcare and that is generally speaking true However, with cost-cutting measures and defunding and and underfunding um various parts of the healthcare system for reasons that I'm not going to go into here, but reasons that are common knowledge, divisions and schisms happen within the continuity of care throughout the entire network of 
health, which includes mental health, physical health, all aspects of it. Now, what this does is it, to follow along in a Lacanian sense, it kind of castrates the ability of healthcare workers, including surgeons. And it may be the case that in order to maintain a sense of, of um, the phallus, that taking on the decisions uh, of management or, or funding cuts or funding burdens or whatever it is that limit the way in which surgeries happen is taken on by a doctor who then says, okay, we can't actually afford to do or whatever it is, X number of these things. So we need to have reasons um, to lessen the load, to shorten the list. Now, again, this is a pure hypothetical, and I don't think it's happening on a conscious level. The reason why I don't think it's happening on a conscious level is this. The ideology we have about, or the idea, I'll say, we have about our healthcare system is not unlike the idea I had about maybe meeting Mari. It wasn't grounded in anything other than my own desires and my own needs. And what happened when Mari passed was I came to uh, this understanding, this realization, this shock, this abrupt shock, that even though I never thought we would actually meet, I could still have this fantasy. I could still imagine that we would. And that meant something to me. And to draw a parallel to the healthcare system, even though I have this idea of the healthcare system, the idea that it will operate in a way that is about my health, my needs, and, and all of the things that may arise if I were to get cancer uh, or in whatever way become ill, then the reality of the situation is presented to me. Well, I shouldn't say presented to me, is imposed upon me. And all of a sudden I experienced this shock whereby the idea I had of what a healthcare system was and the reality of what a healthcare system is are to whatever degree not connected. And so within that break, there's the individuals operating within that system. And it makes sense when you're in the system. So let me back out of medicine for a second and just talk about psychotherapy. In a similar way in psychotherapy, you have all of these people who in Ontario operate under the protected term psychotherapist. What that essentially means is this term is something that can be used to indicate you are credentialed and you have access, clients have access to insurance money if they have a plan that covers psychotherapy. So this is fundamentally an economic tool. Now, this may mean that the individuals doing psychotherapy are good, but it also may mean that they're self-interested. It also may mean any number of the things that human beings do. So if you have a therapist, if you're seeing a therapist and you have a therapist and that's going really well, then you're in a situation where you're feeling really good about it. But if you're struggling to find a therapist or you feel that there's these ruptures with a therapist and, and they don't seem to get you and nothing ever seems to get repaired and or you get cut off, you run out of money or whatever it is, then your experience is a shattering of what you had hoped would happen. Now, those therapists are just doing their quote unquote job, right? They're like, well, I can't afford to have clients for free or, you know, the client wasn't ready for change and they don't like my modality. So they have to go and find somebody else, not my problem. So all of these things start to happen amongst therapists where they find ways to justify the rupture, to justify the way in which the system is set up. If we go back to doctors, this is what I mean when I talk about an, an implicit bias that's going on within this structure. That the doctor's saying, well, this is these are the parameters. Right? This is the way it is. There's nothing really I can do about it. I'm making these decisions. Similarly, I'm a man. I'm a male surgeon. I'm a going to decide about your breasts. There's nothing I can do about it. That's what it means to be a man. To not be able to do that would be to be castrated. 
You could say, well, I'm operating within a system and I'm frustrated. So I'm feeling castrated by the system. So I am going to fight back against that feeling of castration by taking control over your breasts. Again, you know, you might be thinking I'm reading a lot into this and it is a hypothetical, but I don't think it's an entirely unworthy exploration in terms of, and I want to go back to the earlier point. Why did somebody need to decide for Mari what she wanted to do, what she felt was right about her body? And I don't see an answer. I don't see an answer because she did get on a plane to go somewhere else and pay for a treatment. Let's think about that for a second. If this was a morally wrong thing, if she was committing a crime, then she would have come back and been arrested, as ludicrous as that might sound. But what this suggests is she did have the right. What she didn't have was the right circumstance for that right to exist. Here's one more item for you, the last in our civics book, rights. Boy, everyone in this country is always running around yammering about their fucking rights. I have a right. You have no right. We have a right. They don't have a right. Folks, I hate to spoil your fun, but there's no such thing as rights, okay? They're imaginary. We made them up, like the boogeyman. The Three Little Pigs, Pinocchio, Mother Goose, shit like that. Rights are an idea. They're just imaginary. They're a cute idea. Cute. But that's all cute and fictional. But if you think you do have rights, let me ask you this. Where do they come from? People say, well, they come from God. They're God-given rights. Oh, fuck. Here we go again. Here we go again. The God excuse. The last refuge of a man with no answers and no argument. It came from God. Anything we can't describe must have come from God. Personally, folks, I believe that if your rights came from God, he would have given you the right to some food every day, and he would have given you the right to a roof over your head. God would have been looking out for you. God would have been looking out for you. What's, what I liked about this excerpt, George Carlin, and what I liked about it is pointing out that this idea of rights, this idea of control, this idea that they exist, that in and of itself creates a kind of lie. And so the it wasn't that Mari thought she had these rights, is that the doctor thought he had these rights. The doctor thought there was such a thing as an innate, almost God-given right to make this decision. And people can argue it from a policy perspective. They could argue it, as George was saying, from a religious perspective. Either way, these rights are made up. They were made up in a way that decided over the rights of someone else. And this is a kind of murder. Because what's happening here is someone is clearly and distinctly expressing the will of their right upon somebody else's right. Or the will of rights upon rights. And following Carlin, if these rights are made up then now what we're talking about, period, is power. And returning to uh, some of the things I was jotting down is, and, and this is reiterating a couple of points, but the mastectomy was interpreted as the destruction of an implicit symbolic order and the supplanting of this symbolic order. So taking Lacan and Carlin, you've got this idea of a structure, a made-up idea of this structure. And going back... She challenged the surgeon's best professional advice, a truly predictable approach for a critical theorist. She sought to create and exercise agency, a truly predictable approach by a critical theorist. So here is a person, this is going back to what I was saying earlier about being buried alive. She had this complete coherent understanding of what was going on. And I wrote, did Ms. Rudy believe that she had the right of agency? This becomes an existential question because it doesn't guarantee that we will be heard. Certainly any existential experience 
is about the very existence of paradox, which is to say, we have an idea of how the world works and we find that it doesn't work that way and we therefore have to make a choice within those limitations. That she had a duty to think, challenge, express, and to create, and to do so, this is to be. That she held such capricious beliefs, namely that she had the right of petition, in my view goes beyond her right to enact her interests, beliefs, and values, even if they conflicted with the hegemonic status quo. Murray knew better than many how impossible the entire situation is. She'd written about it brilliantly, poignantly, and passionately. I'm struck and haunted. I cannot help but think she must have felt the weight, both pending and by force, as each shovel full was heaved as she was buried alive. It is one thing to have a conviction when prescribed and convenient. It is another to speak to nothingness. She spoke without the right to speak. She spoke authentically. The ability to change is the ability to defy. And perhaps there is nothing more defiant than to request the experience of one's death, that our death be ours. Because in choosing our death, we are choosing our life. We're choosing the way in which we live. And her challenging and spending these days, these years, fighting and challenging was so profound to me because here I am having my little whimsical fantasy about maybe meeting a person I would never meet. And all the while what was going on was this person was challenging to the very end the constructs that she'd been writing about and reading about and considering for a very significant part of her life and I won't do it in this episode but suffice it to say her books reflect that more effectively than any of the words that I can say and so finding Mari searching for Mari experiencing Mari now happens in her books and if there is a gift of defiance, it is that she wrote the expressive life. She lived in a way that conveyed perhaps what is most authentic about her. And she did it with such innate and I want to say elegant words, thoughts, feelings, gestures, actions. And that's really what I find in her writings. In the Summons of Love, she writes, The more we ignore the power of the past to speak in the present, the more we risk abdicating our interpersonal accountability. In contrast, when we take an active interest in the ways in which the unconscious guides our behavior, we increase our capacity to adequately care for those we love. The more connected we are to our reoccurring patterns, the more consistently we are able to catch ourselves whenever these patterns threaten to pull us into rigid networks of behavior that injure others. The more we own our unconscious as our personal liability, the more responsibly we are able to treat those closest to us. This kind of responsibility does not exhaust us, but quite the contrary carves a passageway to more inspired relational possibilities. In this sense, there is no contradiction between our responsibility to others and our ability to feel inspired. 
As much as I kind of wish I could keep on talking, as if that would somehow keep this fantasy I have of Miss Rudy alive, I have to recognize that how I will come to know her will be in her books and in her words. And as grateful as I am for that, I must confess I will, as irrational as it may well be, hold on to my fantasy of maybe crossing paths with her. And I know that this makes no sense. I know that this is not a reasonable thing. But I also know that these feelings and that sense I had in thinking about that possibility was really something wonderful. And I never knew this person. Yet, I want to hold on to that in some way. And so my choice is to hold on to Mari, to Miss Rudy, and to in some way explore beyond my own contradictions and see that this responsibility is also my inspiration. So, a couple of the books that I pulled from, The Summons of Love and The Singularity of Being. There are many other books. Penis Envy is an incredible book. How to Look for Love, Reinventing the Soul, and several others. Um, I also want to make mention that I took an excerpt of a George Carlin comedy routine, and I hope it, in a humorous way, reminds us that these assumptions, these rights, these are things that we make up, and that we have a choice, and the kinds of choices we have can be in the face of incredible stress and profound uncertainty. And this kind of responsibility, as Murray wrote, does not exhaust us, but quite the contrary carves a passageway to more inspired relational possibilities. So until next time, thanks a lot. Bye for now.